Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. All right, this week on the show, we are talking to Aubrey Gordon from the fascinating and extremely popular podcast, Maintenance Phase, which uh, she co-hosts with Michael Hobbs. The New York Times calls it essential listening for anyone who's ever been in the grips of the diet industrial complex and wants to get deprogrammed. We're going to talk about health fads and questionable science like the body mass index, among other things. Then we're going to hear some stand-up comedy from the very funny Chris Mejia, who is probably our first comedian ever to talk about the time that they actually called a suicide hotline and what it was like for them. Uh, We're also going to get some music from one-time public defender turned musician, Danielle Ponder. It's going to be a fascinating, fun show. So don't go anywhere. It all gets started right after this. Ever wondered what it's like to live alone, hidden in the woods, not speaking to a single soul for 30 years, or wander the desert, uncover a hidden well, and dive to the bottom of the deepest water hole for 2,000 miles? The Snap Judgment Podcast takes you there with amazing stories told by the people who lived them. Snap Judgment. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going great. Are you ready for another round of station location identification examination? The first one of 2023, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. This, of course, is a place Livewire is on the radio. Elena's got to guess where I'm talking about. This city is home to the Ploy Festival, which is a pancake type of mix. One of the events at the Ploy Festival is making the largest ploy that you can, currently 12 feet in diameter is the reigning champion. I I see you nodding your head. Do you know where I'm talking about? When I went to Maine, somebody made me a ploy. So I know it's somewhere in Maine, but I don't know. It's probably not Portland or Bangor because we've already used those cities. (laughs) That's right. It is in Maine, though. You never cease to amaze me. It's also home of the International Musky Fishing Derby. Does that narrow it down? (laughs) No. I'm going to give you the point just for getting the right state. I am talking, of course, about Fort Kent, Maine, where we are on W-M-E-F. Woo! I am so impressed. that It's ployé, is that how you say it? It's like a pancake with mixed with an English muffin. So it can like absorb all of the syrups and things into its nooks and crannies. So it, it's really, really good. Oh, man. We got to do a live show from Fort Kent, Maine, so I can have some of that. Uh, all right. Shall we get on to the show? Let's do it. Take it away. From PRX, it's... <laughs> This week, writer and podcast host, Aubrey Gordon. Everything we think we know about diets is science. Everything we think we know about diets is marketing, everybody. And comedian, Chris Mejia. It's cool to go to therapy. It's a bragging right on a dating app to say you're a man who goes to therapy. It's great. The bar has never been lower. (laughs) With music from Danielle Ponder and our fabulous house band, I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now, the host of LiveWire, Luke Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Hi to all the folks listening out there in Ployer country in Fort (laughs) Kent, Maine. We have a great show in store for you this week. Uh, Of course, we asked the LiveWire listeners a question. Uh, We asked, what is a fad that you fell for. This is related to one of our guests this week, and we're going to hear those answers coming up in a few minutes. First, though, it is time for the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder at the top of the show that there is good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news you heard this week? Okay, well, this best news involves two of my favorite things, heavy metal music and stamps. (laughs) A classic overlap of those two worlds. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. So last week, the British Royal Mail released their latest series of stamps, and they've had them devoted to other musical acts in the past, like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. 
but the 2023 musical stamp issue is for Iron Maiden. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Bruce Dickinson and the folks from Iron Maiden. <laughs> I'm sure that every single member of our listening audience can name as many members of Iron Maiden as you. That I just did. <laughs> well, as all of our listeners already know, Iron Maiden is one of the longest running musical acts in British history. They formed in 1977 and they are still touring today. Our listeners can probably name all 17 of their albums, including Number of the Beast, Fear of the Dark, Killers, and my uh, 11th grade AP English teacher's favorite, Power Slave. <laughs> all albums I would have been grounded for life if my very Christian parents had caught me with when I was in middle school. Right, and I think one of the reasons that it had that, those messages is because the covers were so graphic. They always had this mascot, Eddie the Ed. Yes, that Skull Guy. Yeah, Skull Guy is on all 17 album covers, and he's also on four of the 12 Iron Maiden stamps that the British Royal <gasps> Mail <laughs> has just released. And the other eight stamps in the series are of various members of Iron Maiden performing at their notorious, infamous, world-famous live concerts, which they've been doing, you know, for like 40 years. The best news is that you do not have to be a citizen of the British crown to buy them. You can buy lots of different packages, including some kind of a gold foil version that's like mounted in a special case for about 180 bucks. And then the Iron wow. Maiden postal marriage uh, can be alive and well in your home, too. <laughs> you know, I was a bit of a philatelist myself as a kid, Elena. <laughs> I was in the Daniel Bagley Elementary Stamp Collectors Club, and uh, I would have been very excited about some mint Iron Maiden stamps at that age. <laughs> I have some good news related to my TikTok habit, Elena. You know mm -hmm. how I tend to spend far too much time looking at that app. Well, TikTok is finally doing some good in the world. Let me tell you the story of a guy named Frank Steele. Lives in Las Vegas. And for 30 years, he says, he has been dreaming of opening his own restaurant. And he finally did it um, a little while ago, a few months ago. It's called Frank and Sons. They make pizza and subs and all kinds of yummy stuff. But he has not been getting a lot of business. He said sometimes they might only make $400 a day. He was pretty bummed out about it. So somebody who worked for him at this restaurant reached out to a guy named Keith Lee. Okay, Keith Lee is a former MMA fighter in Las Vegas who has now started reviewing restaurants, and particularly restaurants that are not getting a lot of attention. Mm. Keith Lee gets the email from this person that works at Frank and & Sons, and so goes down to Frank & Sons the next day and buys a bunch of the stuff, takes it back to his house, and then sets up his camera because this is what he does. He's got millions of followers now on TikTok where he reviews different kinds of food. And let me tell you, Keith Lee loved the food from Frank and Sons. Let me play you just a little clip of Keith Lee's. I don't know why this is relevant, but he's sitting on a small child-sized Paw Patrol chair while he does this. I just wanted to throw that out there because it's a weird detail that I thought was funny. Interesting. This, Keith Lee reviewing this food. This is one of the best wings I've ever had. This is a 10. Boy. I swear, this is why I started making videos like this. Because places like this that don't nobody know of, this is a 9.8 out of 10. Frank, from me to you, this is my opinion. There is no way you should be behind on rent or struggling to pay rent. That food is delicious. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, Frank. I'm coming back and I'm shaking your hand. Oh, so, I love it. <laughs> Frank did not even realize this was happening, right? He didn't send the email. He did chat, by the way, with Keith Lee at the restaurant, but not realizing that he was setting something in motion that was going to change the course of his life. Frank is now sold out <gasps> of practically everything at Frank and Sons in Las Vegas. People are coming in from all over the country. The uh, video has uh, 40 million views right now, the <gasps> view. And now Frank and Sons' own TikTok page has like a couple of hundred of thousand followers. <laughs> And they keep posting these things that are like, thank you so much for the love and support. We're out of wings. We're out of everything, but please come back. We're going to buy more and, and, and have them for you. It, Frank says it is a miracle. It is totally, in his uh, estimation, saved his business. This one TikTok food review. Oh, I love it. The next time I want to throw my phone across the room because I've been watching an hour of TikToks of just like ducks attacking cats or whatever, I'm going to remember <laughs> that it is a device that can be used for not just good, but great. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best news that we've heard all week.
All right, let's welcome our first guest on over to the show. Uh, she's a writer and podcast host. Her writing has been published in the New York Times and Self Magazine, where she's a regular columnist. Her debut book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, came out back in 2020. And these days, she is the co-host of the extremely interesting and popular podcast, Maintenance Phase, which the New York Times calls essential listening for anyone who's ever been in the grips of the diet industrial complex. Her latest book, You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People, is out now. Take a listen to this. It's our conversation with Aubrey Gordon, recorded in front of a live audience at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland. everybody. Hi, Aubrey. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is a joy. We run into one of those episodes where clearly one of the guests is vastly more popular than us. <laughs> <laughs> and we're okay with that. Yeah, totally fine. <laughs> you have a legion of fans here. Oh. Is that, I mean, <laughs> there you are. Hi, thanks. Great. Six days a week in my home office. <laughs> so, like, every once one of the days of the week is like something like this, and I'm like, this is a real shock to the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious, was there a particular diet fad or a mm. kind of wellness trend that you saw that you thought, I have got to sound the alarm on this and start a podcast? <laughs> no. No, there wasn't like a particular trend, but I think there is this idea. There are a couple of ideas that we all sort of collapse into each other when we're thinking and talking about diets and wellness trends. And one of them is that everything we think we know about diets is science. <laughs> everything we think we know about diets is marketing, everybody. Mm. Right? Like, there's actually a great episode of, I don't know if you guys listen to this, there's a great episode of Decoder Ring uh -huh. uh, where they talk about sort of the invention of hydration, which absolutely charts back to Gatorade trying to market to more than athletes. Uh huh. Mm. Right? <laughs> it's like, that's how we got bottled water. That's how we got the idea that you are dehydrated all the time. That's how we got sort of all of this set of ideas, right? So I think stuff like that, stuff like sort of, the very intentional social construction of an obesity epidemic and the sort of scapegoating of fat people that comes along with all of that felt like, to me, and I think to my co-host, Michael Hobbs, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, it just felt like there was this huge piece missing, right, that we are able to talk about misinformation and disinformation now in politics. We're able to talk about misinformation and disinformation in media. And yet still, some of the smartest, sharpest, critical thinkers I know would go willingly into the whole 30 and be like, I'm never going to get cancer, and now I'm immortal. Right? And you're like, that's not... You shouldn't talk about, no, that's not right. Like, so that felt like the broader thing to illustrate, right, was like it's a lot of the emperor's got no clothes and we should be able to sort of like talk about how those stories come to be and how we perpetuate them and how we sort of allow these myths to, to flourish. Yeah. I'm wondering, you are so natural hmm. on the show as is your co-host Michael Hobbs. Were you in speech and debate in high school? No. Were you a drama kid? Like you just seem completely at ease holding forth for, you know, hours at a time and you're just such a natural at. I'm wondering, oh. had you done something like this before? No, I was an organizer for a long time and you, you know, like I spent just like years and years knocking on people's doors being like, "I'm gay. Do you think I should have anything?" Okay. <laughs> right? Like, and I think that just like hardens you to whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like Literally everything on planet Earth is easier than like ringing the doorbell of the guy whose doorbell placard says Home Security by Smith and Wesson. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I'm going to ask you about gay people. We're going to see how this goes. What does this guy think about immigrants? Let's find out. Ah! Right? So like genuinely like truly everything is downhill right. from that. Especially like being in my pajamas talking into a microphone. That feels very friends. doable for you compared to... Extraordinarily, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm wondering what, I mean, this show is mm. so popular. I'm wondering what you think it says about our society that so many people have latched on to your program. The thing that we hear most from listeners is the idea that we are told directly, right? Like it's not like some hidden message that everyone's tapping into in the same way. It's like... 
No, we're told outright that if you try a diet and you don't lose weight, that's your fault. If you're fat, that is a failing of your character, right? That is a failing of your tenacity. It's a failing of your intelligence. It's a failing of all of these other things, right? So we're piling all of these moral judgments onto ourselves and onto the people around us based on the size of our bodies and theirs. I think people are really thirsty to know that that is not their own brokenness, Mm. right? That that is a brokenness in systems that exist outside of them. And that, sure, thanks. (laughs) Uh, And in systems that shape our thoughts and our behaviors, right? Like it's hard to think about yourself as like, you know, you don't want to think about yourself as gullible. You don't want to think about yourself as anything other than an egalitarian. You don't want to think about yourself in any of these ways. And uh, those are the only ways that we think about ourselves when it comes to our bodies, right? Mm. I want to, um, after the break, talk about what I think is almost sort of the genesis point Hmm. of so many of the things you discuss on Maintenance Phase, which is the BMI scale. (laughs) Sure. So we're going to do that in a moment. This is Livewire from PRX. We're talking to Aubrey Gordon from the Maintenance Phase podcast. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be right back with much more. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Hey, welcome back to Livewire from PRX. My name is Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We're at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. We're talking to Aubrey Gordon from the Maintenance Phase podcast. So you and your co-host, Michael Hobbs, you tackle a whole variety of trends and quote-unquote wellness uh, ideas, talk about uh, apple cider vinegar, how that became such a thing, Um, low-carb diets. And there's one thing that I think really is kind of at the center. It's like the piece of dirt at the middle of the snowball that is all the misinformation around weight, and that's Uh the BMI scale. Yes. Now, I'm sure most of the people listening know what that is, but that's the body mass index, and it was Mm -hmm. supposed to be this thing that would scientifically tell people if they're weight was healthy or not based mm-hmm. on their dimensions. Yeah. How did it get started? <laughs> how did they get it so wrong? And how is it still passed around so much as scientific truth? Okay, so I have bad news for the sound person that I promised not to yell. Um, <laughs> I was like, I won't blow out your levels. Sorry. We're going to talk about the BMI. So, <laughs> so the BMI was developed in the 1800s by a Belgian astronomer and statistician <laughs> who was mad that Belgium was being left behind in the intellectual revolution that was happening. And he was like, I'm going to put Belgium on the map. <laughs> um, and he started looking for these laws called the laws of social physics. He wanted to know how people would behave in any number of situations. And the only data that he had access to was the data that the state already had. So he started dealing with whatever information he could get from the state. And some of that was the height and weight of military conscripts, oh, which is how he developed the BMI. And he figured that the average height and weight should be the ideal. He was looking for the average man as the ideal of humanity, right? That we should all be aiming for the middle. A real weird time in human history. (laughs) Um, Just a a very strange rallying cry. Um, uh, It was then picked up by Sir Francis Galton in the formation of eugenics as a a way of thinking. Rarely a good resume note for something. (laughs) Really special skills. Yeah. I helped out with this. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah. So then it sat on a shelf for about 50 years because everyone was like, why do we need to know your weight divided by your height? What does that help with? And then American life insurance companies came into play and were like, hmm, 
We figure if we can tell some people that they're so fat that they're going to die early that we could charge them more money. Uh, so health insurance companies started using, and uh, life insurance companies started using the BMI as a way to charge some policyholders more than others. Uh, and over time, it just sort of seeped into the medical system. The big study that established the BMI as an individual medical tool was testing it against uh, two other methods, calipers, those like the pinchers, yeah. right? And water displacement. And they were like, the BMI is the easiest one and the cheapest, and it works about half the time, so let's go with that one. <laughs> um, it's also worth noting that the BMI has never been uh, tested on or adjusted for communities of color, and uh, even amongst the white folks and the white men that it was designed for, uh, it, it only sort of accurately, quote unquote, predicts obesity, which is weird language, but here we are, about half the time, and then it goes down from there. So it doesn't even tell you who's fat, <laughs> right? It doesn't do that very well. Uh, and even when it does, uh, it leads to terrible health outcomes for fat people. It leads to terrible health outcomes for communities of color. Uh, it leads to particularly terrible health outcomes for black and indigenous communities. Like, it's, it's bad news all the way down, man. It's bad news all the way down. And now we're at a point where um, many insurers require uh, doctors to weigh their patients at every visit and log a BMI in order to get insurance reimbursement. So now it's also a decision that in some cases is out of healthcare providers' hands. It's like that level of baked in. Uh, I was learning something from the episode that you did, Is Being Fat Bad For You? Mm. Which was uh, really interesting data around the fact that oftentimes people who are underweight or skinny, I should say, have worse health outcomes than people that are somewhat overweight, mm -hmm. which is not taught in schools mm -hmm. ever. I'm wondering, like, what do we get so wrong about this given that I think culturally we've all grown up with and a lot of us still just hold very tightly to, which is being fat is always unhealthy for you. Mm. Being skinny is always healthy for you. Mm. I think part of what we get wrong is that the science starts with that set of assumptions, mm. right? Mm. That the research questions aren't, what would it look like to keep a fat person healthy and alive and living their best life? The questions are, okay, so this fat person is definitely gonna die if they stay this fat. What's going to kill them first, right? Like, those are the kinds of studies that we're getting on fat folks. And there is very little research in the way of, like, here are effective modes of connecting with fat patients. Here are ways that you can actually build rapport and maybe not lecture them about weight loss every time so they don't become part of the, like, overwhelming numbers of fat patients who postpone care for years, right? Like, there are ways through this, and we're not asking those questions at a large enough scale yet to get any real answers there. We start with our own assumptions and then we backfill science to get there is really what it feels like when we're looking at the science of fatness and fat people. And I will also say, boy oh boy, it's real hard to find a fat person who is a researcher listed as an obesity expert. So I will also say there is an utterly bananas and sort of like frankly, on a personal level, pretty deeply insulting layer to this, which is all of the experts in fatness are thin people. Mm. And that's, like, astonishingly gross to me. So, like, I will absolutely get, from time to time, uh, little Twitter lectures from MDs or whoever who will be like, actually, the respectful term is person with obesity. And I'm like, I didn't put it in my handbag. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's not like a separate part of me that is the fat part. <laughs> it's all the fat part. <laughs> like, right. I don't know what we're doing here. Right, but like, it just all feels like we are starting from a place of bias and refusal to interrogate that bias. And so we create a bunch of things that reinforce that bias because it feels good to be right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from any of the people behind any of these fads that you've kind of taken down? Like has Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> reached out? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. <laughs> Someone uh, tweeted at me a couple weeks after we did the Oprah Wagon of Fat episode. Oh. And this person was like, has Oprah tweeted at you yet? And I was like, when have you ever seen Oprah tweet at anyone? <laughs> like, well, that's not what Oprah does. Get out of here. No, we haven't heard from we haven't heard from anybody. We haven't heard from anybody for the most part. Mostly, we hear from. Uh, I will say, when we talk about disgraced researchers in particular, mm. we get like one million graduate TAs who are like, "I knew that guy was rotten." <laughs> <laughs> we get. <laughs> <laughs> 
We get so much from the like the like Jersey Shore house that is academia, the like real world house of just like everyone hates each other, but they never say it to each other. So then they just anonymously email podcasters about like how much they hate their boss. It's a real situation. It's very fun for me. <laughs> this is the most delighted Elena Passarello, who is who is an actual college professor, I think, has oh. ever been. Does this oh. resonate with you? I feel oh. so seen. I think I'm the snooky of this Jersey Shore. <laughs> Not that you speak for all fat people, and I, and I use that term advisedly. Um, Thank you. But like, what would it look like if skinny people were being allies in this? What should people do? What can people do? Oh my gosh, there are big things and there are little things. I would say some of the little things are if you go out to eat somewhere with fat friends, let them pick where to sit. Uh, mm. I think a lot of folks don't think about, folks who haven't had to deal with this don't think about um, a lot of booth tables are bolted to the floor and they are expecting a limited width of person. So if I sit in most of the fixed booths in this town, I end up with just bruising, just like really gnarly bruising, right? Um, that is true of a lot of uh, theater seats or airplane seats. That's true of a lot, like a lot of spaces like that. So I think thinking about stuff like that and just letting folks pick spaces that are comfortable for them and you can follow their lead, that's just fine. Um, I think things like thinking about the weight capacity on furniture and equipment that you buy. If you're in a medical office, thinking about getting an exam table that holds 800 pounds instead of 200 pounds, right? Um, that like very clearly limits the patients you are willing and prepared to offer help mm. to, right, in a medical office. And then I think there are really big things like uh, Joining up with organizations like the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance or the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health uh, to start fighting for fat folks' actual rights to keep their jobs and not be fired just because someone thinks you're too fat mm -hmm. or not be paid up to 20 grand less than thin people doing the same job, right? We're talking about massive, massive gaps. And uh, at this point, it would be like really, really wonderful to have many more folks joining in on some of that harder work, which is uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable to think about the stuff you haven't thought about before and the privileges that you've got and haven't had to interrogate, right? That's always like a weird <laughs> dance to do. And also, uh, when we don't do that dance, like currently I would say fat people are sort of paying the price for a lot of that. Well, yeah. I also really think that maintenance phase, your podcast, mm -hmm. is an entry point for folks, Boy, you know, the because hope. there's so much stuff that you and your co-host bring up that had never occurred to me, mm. you know, either that something is junk science or mm. what somebody's experience in the world as a fat person might be like. Mm -hmm. Backstage, you were telling me the download numbers, and I feel mm. like y'all are reaching a lot of people. Yeah, it's really true. So hopefully that's also it's part really of it. It's really true. Yeah. Aubrey Gordon from the Maintenance Phase Podcast, everybody. Thank you. That was Aubrey Gordon right here on Livewire. You can listen to Maintenance Phase wherever you get your podcasts. Also, Aubrey's new book, You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People, is available now. And check this out. We had so much fun talking to Aubrey that we actually had more content than we could fit into this episode. So if you head over to the Livewire podcast feed, you can hear Aubrey answer some questions from our Jar of Truth exercise, including what seems more dangerous, letting a psychic dictate your life or letting a crypto bro <laughs> dictate your finances. Uh, you know, we only provide you with the hardest hitting journalism here on Livewire. Uh, you can find that also wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, special thanks this week to Jennifer Coyne of Portland, Oregon, who is not only a member of the Livewire Board of Directors, which is, let me just say, a major lift. Managing me, not easy. But Jennifer is also part of the Livewire member community and is generously supporting us with a donation each month. And we are very thankful for that support because it is how we are able to keep doing Livewire. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for keeping the show going. This is Livewire. 
course, each week we ask our listeners a question. This week, because we're talking about diet fads and things like that, we ask the listeners, what's a fad that you fell for? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? I have to say that in my curation of this collection, I have been very biased to all the fads that I fell for. (laughs) Because <laughs> uh-huh, there are right. so many. How about this one from Lauren? Lauren followed the fads of big bangs and jelly shoes all the way. <laughs> jelly shoes. I used to take this nasty curling iron and curl the top part of my bangs back toward the, mm-hmm. the crown of my head and then the front part of my bangs forward toward my nose. And then I would just make this rave hairspray cemented waterfall of I mean, and the rest of my hair, I didn't do anything with. So I just had regular hair and then this like Mr. Softy Well, people thing. were so focused on what was happening on the front that, that meant you didn't even have to invest any time in what was going on in the back. <laughs> what are some other fads that the listeners jumped on? Leah says, I read The Artist's Way three times, ultimate Portland early aughts hippie fad. Uh, did you ever do The Artist's Way? I regularly dated people who told me at length about how much I needed to read The Artist's Way. I still do this thing that's in The Artist's Way. I wake up every morning and I just write a page. You just uh, Really? Yeah, you just handwrite. You can say whatever you want. Um, but because I'm an old lady now and, and more than I'm an artist, it's usually just like grocery lists and things that I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one more fad that one of our listeners did. Oh, this one was anonymously submitted, uh, but I believe it must be an, a millennial because the fad is avocado toast. And then the person adds, this is why I can't afford a house. <laughs> oh my gosh. Of all the fads we've listed, this is the best one because avocado Absolutely. toast is so good. Like I had avocado toast like two days ago and, and I have, I also have a mortgage. I would take avocado toast over the mortgage. Way better, <laughs> way better than having a mortgage. <laughs> If that is why millennials can't afford houses, which, by the way, it's not, it's a good trade, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Thank you to everyone who wrote in with their responses to our question. we got another one coming up for next week's show, which we will reveal at the end of today's program. In the meantime, our next guest has performed stand-up all over the country, including the Tree Fort Music Festival in Boise, Bumbershoot, Madison Comedy Week, and many other places. He was a semifinalist in the Seattle International Comedy Competition, And he's the co-host of the Bachelor and Bachelorette Recap Podcast, We Didn't Get a Rose. And uh, a quick note before we get started uh, with playing you this performance by Chris Mejia. Uh, He does talk about his own personal experience with mental health and also suicidal ideation. Um, We do think it's an important and uh, tough topic that is really presented here uh, with some humor. And we're really grateful that Chris uh, was willing to talk about this on stage. But just a heads up, that's what you're about to hear. Chris Mejia, recorded at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland. Live wire with, hello, hello. I'm a huge advocate for mental health. I firmly believe we should all care about mental health. Uh, Especially, yeah, shout out. We out here sad. uh, And I love therapy. I've been going to therapy for several years because I'm better than you. And I think it's dope that now we've transitioned as a society to get to the point where now therapy is the buzzword. It's a trend. It's cool to go to therapy. It's a bragging right on a dating app to say you're a man who goes to therapy. It's great. The bar has never been lower. <laughs> it used to not always be this way. Now people are talking so openly about therapy. It's great. People are like, oh, I go see a therapist. They're like, oh, my God, my therapist is keeping my group chat alive. Or, oh, my God, your therapist said that they sound like such a Pisces. Like, it's just. (laughs) But here's the thing. One thing about therapy people don't realize. People think you just need to go to therapy a couple times, and then, boom, your abandonment issues are cured. And that's not how therapy works. Because who you are as a person is always changing and evolving. So you're never a finished product. You're going to have to work on yourself until the day you die, and you're always going to need to go to therapy because of that. And the way I learned that was because there's moments in my life where I realized despite all of the years of therapy I've had, the therapy is not working at all. <laughs> Last time I had that moment, I'll never forget. I was leaving my therapist's office, and my therapist, as I'm leaving, he just looks at me. He's like, Chris, I just want to let you know it's been an absolute pleasure to witness the growth you've experienced over these past couple of years and to see the person you become 
It's been an honor to be your therapist, and I'm proud of you. And I almost responded, thanks, Dad. Now I gotta hire a second therapist <laughs> to talk about what I almost said to my first therapist. <laughs> Only way that would have been worse was like, thanks, daddy. Like that's <laughs> That's how you get a restraining order. But when talking about mental health, we need to realize that also involves talking about the dark, uncomfortable things about mental health. Like, for example, I'm going to keep it a buck with y'all. Last year, I got super depressed, so much to the point where I had a mental breakdown and I wanted to kill myself. I did. And I did it! Spoiler alert. <laughs> For three reasons. One, I called the National Suicide Lifeline and it saved my life. <laughs> Which, real quick side note, I had multiple breakdowns last year, multiple times where I wanted to kill myself and I called Suicide Lifeline several times. And the first time I called the national one, that was the only one I knew, it saved my life. And the second time I had a breakdown, I did some research, I found out, and this is true, there's a smaller lifeline that was like religious owned. And me personally, I believe in supporting small local businesses. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna do a field survey and find out who does a better job keeping me alive. That's. <laughs> and I called that lifeline. And let me tell you, that lifeline sucked. <laughs> it was. <laughs> It was not good at all. I had an older white man help me out. I can tell it was an older white man because his name was Richard. He didn't go by Rich, and I could hear the new balances on his feet. Uh, <laughs> and this is true. This is true. I was telling him, I was like, I feel like I'm not going to ever find someone who will love me for me and feel like I'm ever going to be enough and I don't want to live. And he told me, this is true, he was like, you need to suck it up and deal with rejection because life is full of rejection and you need to be strong to overcome it. And my motivation to live became purely out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna let this man be right, are you kidding me? <laughs> but I, I live for three reasons. One, I call it the suicide lifeline. Two, because honestly, I hate spontaneous plans. <laughs> I got tickets for Hamilton next Friday. What am I doing? And three, because at that moment, I felt like killing myself <laughs> was just too much of a commitment. <laughs> Which is just a weird way to find out you have commitment issues. <laughs> Even my therapist was like, I'm glad you found the solution, but the math you did was all wrong. <laughs> and here's the thing. I understand it's weird and uncomfortable to hear people talk about suicide. I understand that. I don't blame you if you feel weird and uncomfortable. But if we truly want to eliminate the stigma around mental health and suicide, we can't get weird and uncomfortable when people speak up about it. Yeah. Your clap. Your claps are very nice, but I got like a minute left. Let me rush through this. <laughs> and that's why I want to talk about it tonight, because I knew someone who was brave enough to talk about calling the lifeline and inspired me to call, and I called and it saved my life. And thank God calling the lifeline saved my life, because the first impression of calling the lifeline was not good at all. Because after having a mental breakdown, all I needed was the comfort of a stranger's voice. And all I heard <laughs> was a robotic voice. That was like, you matter. Please hold. <laughs> <laughs> like, I right, now I gotta live long enough to not die to elevator music. <laughs> I gotta at least live long enough so I can talk to the operator and complain. <laughs> like, first of all, you need to get this Windows 95 screensaver music out of here. <laughs> all right, inspire me to live. Play some Megan Thee Stallion.
But I will say, despite the fact that that's how the call started, the operator truly was. I didn't even believe they were going to help me. And they really, the operator was able to help me get to a good place. And I'll never forget, at the end of the call, the operator was like, I unfortunately have to go. Because there's a lot of people calling, and there's only so many of us operators. But I want you to know, I genuinely care about your safety. So please, be honest with me. What are your plans for the rest of the night? And I told her, I'm like, because of your help, I'm choosing to live tonight. So honestly, the only thing I'm going to do when I hang up this phone is go get some Taco Bell. <laughs> and then the concern in her voice <laughs> was more than when I said I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> How low do we think of Taco Bell? <laughs> Where she was like, oh, Taco Bell, code red. I got 10 more minutes. I can talk. <laughs> You're getting a chalupa? That does count as self-harm. That counts. <laughs> Y'all been a lot of fun on Christmas here. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. That was Chris Mejia. You're on Livewire performing at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland. You can find him on Twitter at Topher Mejia. And if you or someone you know is in need of support, please do call the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarella. We've got to take a quick break, but do not go anywhere because we will be back with some incredible music from Danielle Ponder. Stay with us. Welcome back to Livewire. I'm Luke Burbank, here with Elena Passarello. Before we get to this week's musical guest, a little preview of next week's show. Uh, first up, we are going to be talking to true icon, filmmaker, actor, and tiny mustache enthusiast John Waters about his first foray into writing fiction, uh, which he's done with his book, Liar Mouth. Also, he's going to tell us why he will never leave Baltimore uh, spoiler alert, it's because there are some very famous bathrooms that are named for him there in Baltimore. We're also going to be talking to writer Sasha LaPointe about how the TV show Twin Peaks impacted her life as a young native woman in the Pacific Northwest. And as if all that weren't enough, we have got even more, a musical performance from one of our very favorite bands, Deep Sea Diver. So please do tune in for all of that. Plus, as always, we're going to be looking to get your answers to our listener Question, Elena, what are we asking the listeners for next week's show? We want to know if you could have anything named after you, what would it be? <laughs> so, <laughs> this, of course, if you're in Baltimore, the bathrooms are taken. They're named for John Waters, just as a heads up. Not all the bathrooms, just the ones at that art museum. Yeah, yeah, the Baltimore Art Museum. You're right. There's, there's still a chance for some of these people. Uh, anyway, if you want to give us your answer to something you'd like to have named after you, you can hit us up on Twitter or Facebook. We are at Live Wire Radio. All right, our musical guest this week initially turned to a career in law after her brother received a 20-year three-strikes prison sentence. Uh, she served as a public defender in her hometown of Rochester, New York. Um, but at the same time, she was playing music in numerous bands and was really drawn to that and so eventually took a leap of faith by leaving the public defender's office to focus on her songwriting. Written and recorded over three years, her mesmerizing debut album, Some of Us Are Brave, received critical acclaim and has earned her new fans all over the country, including us here on Livewire. Take a listen to Danielle Ponder, who joined us on stage at Revolution Hall here in Portland, Oregon. Hi, Danielle. Hello. How are you? I heard, Danielle, that your, um, your dad was a pastor. He still is a pastor, kind of, sort of. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I was, my dad was a pastor as well. Mm -hmm. And um, like you, we were not allowed to listen to non-Christian music. Yep. I'm wondering, did you develop a system for listening to secular music on the low? You know what? I just told my brother I was so thankful that he would, like, sneak in hip-hop tapes. But honestly, when my dad would find them, he would destroy them. But that was, like, the only way we heard it. 
But I would like make up songs because I would go to school and be like, did you hear that new Janet Jackson song? And I just completely make it up because, of course, I, <laughs> I didn't hear it. So I'm also thankful because I think that's how I became a songwriter, lying about knowing pop songs. So. Wow. <laughs> um, you, you were a public defender. I'm wondering if there's any overlap, uh, now you're a professional musician, between those two worlds. Does mm -hmm. anything you learned, like in law school or practicing law, inform the world of being a singer or vice versa? Yeah, I think that the world of being a singer helped me be a better public defender because I think public defense is also about storytelling, um, telling your client's story in a way uh, where the jury becomes empathetic or the judge becomes empathetic. And that's the same thing you're doing as a songwriter. You're telling these stories in a way uh, where the audience can connect or relate. So to me, both of them share the art of storytelling. What's your... Um What's your process for how do, you, how do you create a song? Every artist is sort of different with that. You know, I start with the music first, usually on guitar, maybe on keys. And then Avis comes in and adds like all of the actual magic to it. And then the lyrics come later. I think the music tells me what the song is about. Um, and I don't write down my lyrics. I put on my headphones. I get in the booth and I start singing. And um, it just comes out. <laughs> Now, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily try to describe your music as not being Christian, but is your dad okay with the fact that you are singing what is basically secular music? You know, if you ask my dad, I'm still a lawyer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what he's proud of. He's like, yeah, yeah, but she's a lawyer. She's a lawyer. <laughs> I don't think he's really accepted that I am now a full-time musician, okay. but he does love my music, but not as much as he loves bragging about having... <laughs> A lawyer for a daughter. Well, he should be very <laughs> proud of both things. What song are we going to hear? Uh, you're going to hear Only the Lonely, which is a sad song about the breakup I went through a few months ago. So, oh. yay. All right. <laughs> this is Danielle Ponder with Avis Reese here on Livewire. Listen, darling, to every word I say, I left you long before today. My sweet darling, don't even try to sway, love is lost and I must walk away. I know I've said it once before. But now I feel it more and more I know I've said it once before But now I feel it more and more Only the lonely stay When love's no longer served the fire doesn't burn They hold on So desperately mm -hmm. There's a truth in the dark it's gonna break you down, so steal your heart. You don't love me, you're just lonely. That's what my man say. Your daddy left you guilty. That's what you don't see. And I give up trying, cause I'm feeling worlds apart. And you'll never call it, though you're staring at the clock. I know I've said it all before But now I feel it Only the lonely stay When love's no longer served The fire doesn't burn They hold on 
That was Danielle Ponder here on Livewire. Her latest album, Some of Us Are Brave, is available now. Also, Danielle is on tour this year, so catch her when she comes to a town near you. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. A huge thanks to our guests, Aubrey Gordon, Chris Mejia, and Danielle Ponder. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing and production manager is Paige Thomas. And our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, Al Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer. And our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff this week. We'd like to thank member Jennifer Coyne of Portland, Oregon, who is also a member of our board of directors. Thanks, Jennifer. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank. For Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew, thank you for listening, and we will see you next week.